Welcome to Engaging and Empowering School Libraries, a podcast that aims to raise the profile of school libraries by talking about topics that are current across education and teaching. We hope to help you engage with the FOSSIL, the content on the FOSSIL group website, introduce you to people who are using FOSSIL in schools, and most of all, just have a conversation about the role of school librarians within education. Today, Daryl and I are celebrating our first year of podcasting about FOSSIL education and school libraries. After finishing last month with a two-part history of school libraries, we decided to put this session into your hands and ask for questions from our listeners. We'll work through some of them today, hopefully. We'll get through them all. Um, but if not, we'll respond in some other way if we can. So thanks for joining me again, Daryl, today. I hope you are well. A year already that's flown by, hasn't it? That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start by taking us back to the IFLA School Library Guidelines. There was a question that was asked about the publication date being 2015 and whether that made it dated. What would be our response to that first one? Um, so just a, just a quick reminder, uh, the, the IFLA UNESCO uh, so it's it's quite rare for a, a a document to be endorsed by UNESCO. So the uh, IFLA school school library manifesto, the first manifesto, uh, uh, was published in 1999. So that was the IFLA UNESCO school library manifesto. Um, the first edition of the uh, IFLA school library guidelines, which were all also endorsed by UNESCO. So the IFLA UNESCO School Library Guidelines first edition um, that was published in 2002. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the revised edition, the second edition of the IFLA School Library Guidelines was published in 2015. Uh, and then the revised manifesto. Uh, so that was endorsed by IFLA in 2021. And it is, as far as I understand it, it is still with UNESCO for endorsement. So, oh, okay. yeah, so it's very, very difficult and a time consuming process to get uh, UNESCO endorsement. So um, that manifesto 2021 has been um, approved by IFLA and mm -hmm. is with UNESCO for endorsement. So, uh, the point here is that the, the guidelines um, translate the principles of the manifesto into practical terms. Um, and as such, they establish a developmental trajectory. So they, they point in a direction. Um, but um, the guidelines then need to be implemented according to national regional, local, and even building level circumstances. Yeah. Um, so the question really then is what professional guidelines exist? So in our case, uh, in the UK, um, from the SLA and or SLG and or schools library services um, yeah. to help us implement the principles um, th so th th those practical principles in the um, guidelines. Uh, so, for example, there the school library group uh, guidelines for secondary school libraries. Uh, that was published in 2014. Okay. Um, so just to give a practical example from 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 us from myself. Um, yeah. So within that developmental trajectory of the IFLA school library guidelines, um, adjusted to our building level circumstances, so my particular school. Um, so just for example, I use the um, SLA guidelines for print collection development. Um, so both in terms of their recommendation for the nonfiction fiction split um, as well as the um, Peter's average book prices that they provide. So uh, I use the SLA guidelines for that. Um, however, for staffing levels, um, I look to the Australian School Library Association guidelines for staffing. Mm -hmm. 
And the reason for that is because they understand the librarian's role in terms of uh, a, a teacher librarian um, with a, uh, to a greater or less extent, a focus on inquiry. Um, so they have uh, a very good understanding of the level of staffing, professional and paraprofessional, um, that is necessary to su support such a program. Um, and then I look specifically to New York State um, for an inquiry-centered instructional program because of um, my work on fossil based on Barbara Stripling's work. Um, so in terms of understanding what an inquiry-centered instructional program looks like and um, the components of that, I look to uh, the Empire State Information Fluency Continuum. Okay, so um, well, no, so yeah, so then just to 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 finish off that point, um, so the revised manifesto took considerable collaborative work and time to produce, um, and at the time that they were doing that, the um, within IFLA, it was felt that the developmental trajectory of the guidelines, so the direction that it points us in, um, was still sufficiently sound, um. For, for them not to consider revising the guidelines at that point. Um, however, uh, I have no doubt that when there is an international consensus to do so, um, especially given the new uh, manifesto, that when there is a consensus that it's necessary to do so, they will look at that. But that is a, because it's an international collaborative effort, um, it takes a huge amount of work, huge amount of coordination, huge amount of time. Plus, I think the other reason why it wasn't felt that the guidelines needed revision um, is because individual countries um, are needing to implement the principles um, according to their local conditions. So um, different countries are more or less far in the implementation of the principles of the guidelines. Um, so some will be further ahead, others will be further behind. When it is felt that a new version of that is required, um, I have no doubt that they will revisit that. So the interesting thing then from what I'm hearing and understanding myself about the guidelines is that they are a real overarching view of this is, um, an aspirational, an inspirational view of how your school library could run, but without the nitty gritty understanding of each individual element, um, they're as as they're, they're more useful if you are actually looking beyond them. Although we need to take them as as they are. Um, so you you have to look beyond them because, yeah. so say for yeah. example, if we look at the um, so if we just look at the instructional. Um, the, the core instructional activities of um, the librarian. Uh, yes. So those five core activities. Um, so in terms of developing an inquiry-centered instructional program, yes. um, it's not possible to look to either, well, until recently, it hasn't been possible to look to the SLA or to SLG. So no. they have nothing to say. However, with, with um, the SLA's support of FOSSIL and the introduction of an inquiry section in their new website, which um, I'm working with them to develop, um, if somebody were responding to the IFLA school library guidelines wanted to implement an inquiry-centered instructional program, they would then be able to look for guidance to the SLA. But certainly up until recently, I had to look elsewhere for that. So it's interesting, isn't it? So we need to make sure that it's it's almost a, a, a path that it is sending you on, but you definitely need to go and find the information elsewhere to suit your own 
individual school and needs, isn't it? So, um, yes, those five core instructional activities. Okay, what the top one is is um, uh, reading promotion, isn't it? Literacy and reading promotion. That doesn't tell you how to do it. <laughs> you have to go and find that out for yourself. And and you know most school librarians will know and understand that they're actually achieving that through X, Y, and Z. Um, for the others, it is it is open to exploring a bit more. So although we do recommend the IFLA School Library guidelines, the fact that they're twenty fifteen doesn't matter because of the manifesto that's been worked on and implemented hopefully soon. Um, and ultimately, because it's an international guidelines, the expectation that you're going to burrow down to what's important to you in your school is is equally important. Um. So I'd I'd say I'd I'd say maybe not what. So so because we, we'll we'll touch on this when we come to the last. So we'll return to this when okay. we come to the last question. But um, I think it, it's it's more than what is important to you. Um, I think the, the 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 guidelines serve um, a more fundamental purpose. So the the point of the guidelines is that that they represent an international consensus based on. Um, research over when it was published 50 years of what an effect the, so the conditions that are necessary for an effective school library yeah. so over 50 years worth of research into the effectiveness of school libraries um, results in a, a picture of what a library ought to do yes um, so those conditions, those um, elements, um, the direction that that leads us in, um, that's why it's aspirational and inspirational. So um, some or most or possibly all might be beyond me at this particular given point in time in my school, um, e even in my country. However, um, it's something that I strive towards. So each one of us, um, with more or less help from our professional associations in helping us to implement them in practice, um, each one of us has to figure out what the balance is, how we maintain the balance, and where we look for more specific um guidelines for actually helping us to implement implement it in reality okay right we're not going to get through all these questions are we <laughs> well, so we've answered some, uh, uh, we've touched on some of the ones that will come so so let's look at how how can we balance inquiry with all the other things that we need to do i think that was a really interesting question because librarians get school librarians especially are yes people aren't they they They've got hands in all sorts of different pies. We're now saying that we would like them to think about how to introduce inquiry into, into everything else that they do. What would we say to that? So um, we've already touched on this now. Um, so I would argue we're not, we're not asking librarians to introduce inquiry. We're asking librarians to frame, well, we're not asking them to, um, I'm saying that <laughs> this is what I think. Yes, absolutely. Um, so from my perspective, we're not asking um, librarians to introduce inquiry. We're asking librarians to frame all of the core instructional activities through inquiry. So... Um, if we have an inquiry-centered instructional program that includes literacy and uh, um, reader, de um, reader development and, and literacy, um, it includes the development of media and information literacy skills within a broader framework of inquiry learning skills. It includes... So that, I guess so that allows us to 
had to frame or, or uh, you know let's talk about individuals rather than than our, our expectations of school librarians you're right Daryl we need to talk about us and how we do it and what we are thinking and our opinion and actually if we can as a school librarian if I was thinking about the literacy and reading promotion that I currently do if I change it to be thinking about my literacy program encompassing the whole curriculum and not just focusing on fiction then then it can quite easily be put into an inquiry framework can't it because it's it's engaging with the curriculum it's taking it you know giving it a wider platform um so the balance the balance is not necessarily do more the balance is about is about re-understanding what it is the purpose of the school library isn't it yes um and so um i think again uh we're always going to have so it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what school we're in it doesn't matter how many members of staff are in the library team it doesn't matter how big our budget is um we will always have more to do than we can do so i have worked in a school where i was a solo librarian and i have worked in a school where i was part of a team of eight not all of them were full-time um some professionally qualified librarians some um library assistants uh but we were I, I was always needing to decide what my priorities were and how how those activities related to each other. Um, so um, for me, uh, in terms of balancing what I need to do, it's an in, for me, it's an inquiry centered instructional program that um, encompasses all of the core instructional activities. Um, but that is expressed through our purpose and mission statement. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the library's purpose and mission statement in the light of this. So for me, the library's purpose is to enable understanding of the world and ourselves in it. And the mission is through reading both non-fiction and fiction yeah so um understanding the world and ourselves in it is inquiry that is the definition of inquiry um we are dependent to a greater or lesser extent and certainly in school to a greater extent so for our knowledge of the world and ourselves that comes through reading yeah um whether that's a textbook, whether that's a nonfiction book, um, whether it's notes that the teacher has given, um, and whether that is fiction. So I understand the world, I understand myself through reading. Yeah. Um, as we've shown um, and have begun to develop, there are different kinds of reading in, in, in each stage of the inquiry process. Yeah. So that then brings in the resources. So the resources need to be developed, whether they print, whether they are subscription databases, whether it's searching the, um, the web for information um, in order to be able to learn about the world and ourselves from information, we need information. Um, so the collection development fits into that. Um, yeah. In terms of... Uh, collaborating with teaching staff I need to advocate I also need to provide CPD yeah so all of the instructional activities then um, are integrated into an inquiry centered instructional program and the challenge is um, prioritizing and being disciplined about those priorities but that's almost easier to do once you have your mission statement and purpose Absolutely. because you can then make genuine decisions on 
why you are or not going to do something that somebody has asked you to do. But it also enables you to go, the reason I can't do this is because, and either offer them something else because it's more in line with whatever it is that they're doing, or you're explaining to them that you, you're you working on something with another teacher and, and that is in line with what you do. It, it's about different conversations, isn't it? It's about, like you say, it's advocacy, isn't it? It's about empowering yourself to be able to understand what it is that you do and why. Yes, and, and, and it also serves a further purpose because not only does it help clarify to me what it is that I'm doing, and how I go about it, um, but it also helps me to explain to my colleagues what it is that I do and how I do it and yeah. what they can expect or should be expecting. Yeah. So it changes their perception of who I am and what I do and, crucially, how I can help them with what they do. Yeah. So their expectations change as well. Yes. That's the interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so so that does sort of move us on quite nicely to the next question, which was how can school librarians support their school strategic development plan? Now, I've been talking to a lot of librarians recently about the importance of creating a strategic plan um, uh, for the library, but actually that link to... The school strategic development plan is hugely important. So, how can we, how can they, how can school librarians support it? Um, so, in a certain sense, we've already basically answered that question because yeah. um, all schools broadly serve the same or a very similar purpose. Yeah. Um, and depending on how you uh, formulate your purpose and mission, so the reason why I use purpose and mission, we've spoken about this before, is um, because of Simon Sinek's work um, on starting with your purpose and the mission is how you accomplish that. Yeah. Um, so... The way, the way that I have formulated our purpose and mission um, is fundamentally aligned with um, the purpose of the school. So, so where the library makes a unique and specific contribution to the school's purpose is in the mission. So the school achieves its purpose Um, in different ways. So there are different components to um, how the school achieves its purpose. Okay. Um, but, so in a certain sense, um, the, the school will have a number of different missions, ways that it accomplishes the purpose. Um, the way that I have defined our purpose and mission is that that um, becomes a mission of the school. So enabling knowledge and understanding through reading, surely that um, must be on some level part of what any school does. So the library is uniquely positioned to contribute to what the school is trying to achieve in that specific way. But even if that's not written in the school's mission, own school's mission. Yes, so... Are you suggesting that that you try and get that into the school's mission or mission state, strategic development plan, or, or are you suggesting that there will be something within it that does link to that and you will be able to attach it to it? Yes, so... Yes. Uh, I think I think that um, so there's a strategic development plan and then I think there is a, a kind of an operational development plan or an improvement plan, which is more operational. Um, so I think the first task is to. Um, because a school's. 
purpose and overall mission is never going to is never going to substantially change. So what a, what a school claims makes it unique and what it's striving for and what it's trying to produce, um, that is going to be pretty stable. So um, to formulate the library's purpose and mission with reference to that, and then the school is always going to be focusing on different things to help it achieve that. So I think mm -hmm. that's where we move on to a more operational. So over the next five years, we're focusing on this. Yeah. Um, and then the task is, with each iteration of that development plan, um, to highlight what aspects of the inquiry-centered instructional program most help achieve that. So say, for example, our focus... Um, possibly last year or the year before, I, I can't remember, was on reading for learning. Right. Well, that's a fundamental part of what we do. So all I needed to do was to highlight those aspects of um, the... Uh, so the, li the library development plan, um, but those aspects of the instructional program that developed that. Yeah, that links to the program yeah. that they were specifically looking at. Yeah. Uh, another example, um, the um, the school was placing an emphasis on um, students' ability to express themselves, um, to present themselves. Um, so that that is a, a a formal part of the inquiry process in the express stage. Um, yeah. So of all of the instructional work that we were doing with colleagues um, to highlight those ones where students were being given an opportunity in Express to speak publicly. Yeah. So it's making the links. It's not adding to the workload. It's really it, it's it all seems to be coming around to the same thing, doesn't it? It's it's how we do what we do. And how we can link it. It's, yes. Yeah. How we define fun. how we define ourselves, how we articulate that, how we go about that, and then it's a case of highlighting those aspects of what we're doing in relation yeah. to what is currently a focus in the school. Okay. So talking about focuses in the school, let's move to the next question. Artificial intelligence has come up quite a lot. Um, I know that I personally have been asked to do two or three sessions towards the end of the year on school libraries and artificial intelligence and their role. Um, you know, we've got things like academic integrity, honesty and augmentation intelligence. There's such a, such a huge thing. What do you think, what is the role? What is the role of the school librarian currently in a few short words? Can we answer that one quickly? No. <laughs> <laughs> However, so that one, <laughs> go on then, do, do what you can, very briefly. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, adopt maybe a controversial stance. Maybe we can return to this in the next podcast because um, I've, got, I, I've just written an academic integrity policy. So I, I created that from scratch okay. in terms of what we are doing at school. Um, and I'm doing an inset on Wednesday on academic integrity, which it's not possible to talk about without reference to artificial intelligence. What's up? Yeah, yeah. Um, but in my opinion, um, artificial intelligence is going to prove to be spectacularly bad news. Okay. all concerned <laughs> um, so if i if i just if maybe, i just maybe we, maybe we put this in 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 quotes um unpopular opinion <laughs> okay uh, so if i if, if 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 i give you if i give you one quick example okay so academic integrity um is about the kind of person who you are 
or yeah. are becoming. Yes. So it's 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 about your character. Yes. Um, so that is a combination of wanting to behave in a certain way, but also having been equipped to behave in a certain way. Yeah. So so I, yeah, so I, I won't be able to explain this this very well. I'll just highlight three steps that I think lead us to a very difficult place. Okay. So um when when resources were scarce, um libraries were great because if people wanted information, they had to go to the library. Um that Absolutely. made us special. Yes. All of a sudden the internet and the World Wide Web appeared. Yeah. Um and all of a sudden uh, we weren't that special anymore because of the resources that we controlled. Yeah. Um, so some librarians fought against that and some embraced that. Yeah. Problem is um, that we made the technology our focus. Yeah. Not the use of the technology and the resources and the information that they contained. Yes or learning so we didn't concern ourselves with the learning process yeah so then then the problem is google becomes the default for various reasons which is not a good thing so so initially it's a good thing because it has a good search function yeah so it um finds relevant websites yeah. that we can consult yeah uh, what happens is that popular becomes good. So when looking for information about some, um, um, in terms of knowledge, knowledge about something, um, we then get that default of Google Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, from an instructional point of view, our focus should have been on, um, so, so there, 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 there were problems with, um, um, the extent to which Google was factu factually accurate, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our focus should have been on how our students learn from that information. Yes. So in that sense, whether it's accurate or not is, is one problem. The more important problem really from our perspective is that Wikipedia is not written for school children. Yes. So if children copy and paste, even if they're not intending to cheat, um, they are. Yes. So the character that those children are developing by copying and pasting and us allowing them to so even I think we fooled ourselves that because it was relatively easy to detect, copy and paste, um, our focus was on catching people having copied and pasted, not on finding information at the right level and then the difficult process as they get older of making sense of that information and using that information and then crediting it. Yeah. So then the second step, so there are three steps. The second step is that Google, I think, so Google becomes the default. Yeah. Um, and I'll 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 send you a link to an article by Cory Doctorow that you can add. Mm -hmm. Um be, because so, so that article is called Even If You Think AI Search Could Be Good, It Won't. Okay. Um so the, so the second thing that happens is that because search then is linked to advertising, there is evidence that at a certain point they deliberately made search worse Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. in order for people to spend longer searching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we've got this next stage now where they appear to be moving away from providing you with the list of results, even though the good results are buried in advertising um, and other 
garbage. So yeah. struggling to find what you're looking for um, is being replaced by an answer. Yes. Not, not in all instances, though, because things like perplexity does give you the link to the article that it was found. So if we didn't learn from our experience with Wikipedia that no student is going to look at the footnotes and follow yes. up. Yes, okay. So we, we, we fooled ourselves if we think that's going to happen. Okay, so, so, we, so we have got a problem. Uh, I have no doubt. I think it's a really, really interesting conversation to be had at a later date. I think, I hope, like we've got no choice, AI is here and we have to find a way to make sure that we as school librarians are providing the knowledge and skills that our students need in order to move forward with it, to become whole people rather than people who just take what they're given. Um, I'll, I'll be interested in talking to you about that one again. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> um, next question. Historical development of school librarianship in America, Australia, and UK. This is a really interesting one because we mentioned in the history of school librarianship, didn't we, that at one point, um, America and Australia went down the teacher librarian route and we didn't. We stayed with librarianship. So... Um, I think the question was, can we explain more about why that was the case? Um, so this, the, so this is actually, actually very complicated. Um, so the only progress that I've managed to make since we last spoke um, is that in Australia, well, actually, I'll start where it formed first. So in America, the American Library Association was formed in 1876. That was followed in 1877 by the Library Association in the UK and followed by the establishment of the American, um, sorry, the uh, Australian Library Association in 1894. Um, so then in America, uh, we have the formation of the um, American Association of School Librarians in 1914. Right. Um, followed in the UK by the formation of the SLA, the School Library Association, in 1937. Followed by the Australian School Library Association in 1969. That's quite a long time after, yeah. Um, and then we've got um, SILIP SLG, the School Libraries Group, uh, which was formed in 1979, although that seems to have been preceded by something called the School Library Resource Centre Subcommittee or Group. Um, okay. So there was something with a focus on school libraries that existed before that. Yeah. Um, and, and the difference there is between a subgroup and a special interest group. And I think the special interest, the difference is that the special interest groups are member driven um, as opposed to be being driven by the um, the association. Okay. Uh, now, as far as I can tell, so all, all in all of those countries, school libraries um, emerge in schools So, so that is driven by teachers. So that that's not that's not driven by library associations. So schools develop libraries, and um, teachers are given responsibility to those libraries. Okay. For for yeah, they're given responsibility for those libraries. Um, now, I think so. I was reading. Um, I must just sorry. I must just check it check her name uh um laurel clyde's uh doctoral thesis the magic casements a survey of school library history 
from the 8th to the 20th century, focusing specifically on um, Australia, America, and the UK. Right. Now, what seems... So, so, so there's one sentence where she speaks about um, what seemed to happen in the UK is that the library association... So, so what happens is you've got teachers who are responsible for libraries. Yeah. They need training in yeah. librarianship. Yeah. And what seems to happen in Australia and America um, is that universities, either as part of the... And either and, I think, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but as part of um, teacher education include library um education okay okay or and um develop um, library schools develop school library specialization nice but the key seems to be that the the associate the professional associations in those two countries were purposeful about their teaching identity. Yeah. And that librarian, school librarianship was a specialization. Right. Whereas, so it's just a sentence in, because um, I, I, I didn't have a chance to read it all carefully, but there's just a sentence that caught my eye was that in the UK, the library association place the emphasis on chartered librarians. Right. Okay. Now, I'm not 100% sure exactly when that happened and why, but but the impression I got from what she was saying is that um, at a certain point, for some reason, um, the UK places the emphasis on the librarian part. Um, right. And I think... We've never recovered. So in, in terms of what we're talking about as a, a teacher librarian, we've never recovered from that um, because I think that that has become, well, certainly still is to a, a, um, a greater, ex, greater or lesser extent um, how school librarians in the UK identify themselves. Okay, so that really leads us nicely onto the final question, which is um, quite a political one, which is interesting. So given the strong possibility of a change of UK government, what challenges and opportunities might a Labour government bring to the school library sector? That's a big question again. I don't know how we're going to manage to answer that one quickly. Well, yeah, I mean, th there's a lot to say and also... Um given how sudden the announcement was and, yeah. and in a sense unexpected the announcement was uh details still need to emerge but i think broadly there are a couple of things that we can say that are both opportunities but also challenges um i mean i think the first thing is that uh if you look on l the the labor website um uh, uh, their, their statements about education uh, on positively um, there is language like this um, young people are not being prepared for work or for life uh, they should be supported to develop the skills to shape and use new technologies to generate ideas to respond to climate change harness advances in science for all our benefit our education system should build confidence and resilience um, knowledge and skills and the love of learning to carry throughout life. Uh, that way, all young people will get the chance to thrive in a rapidly changing world. That's language that we've been using about, about inquiry from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, that language, I think, if you look at some of the um, comments about the departure of Michael Gove, who was Education Secretary, yeah. Um, and how damaging for some people um, changes that he brought about were. 
um, which I think are a combination of um, an overemphasis on content, the amount of content, um, the way of delivering that content, um, the assessment of that content, uh, underfunding of education, deprofessionalization of teachers. Um, they, they're two very different pictures. Yeah. The language that Labour are using um, is potentially encouraging. Okay. If we have been positioning ourselves, I think, um, if we've begun to position ourselves um, and begun to deliver an inquiry-centered instructional program. So that takes work and it takes time. We ought to have been doing that. Yeah. Um, but um, the first six steps that they've set out, the sixth step relates to education, and that is to recruit 6,500 new teachers in key subjects to set children up for life work and the future good news yeah. um possibly for us uh yeah. paid for by ending tax breaks for private schools okay so funds are going to be squeezed i think for private schools given how bad the situation in many state schools are in terms of buildings, teacher recruitment, teacher retention. Um, I'll be very surprised if immediately the focus is on school libraries. Yes. However, um, it does remind us of what we looked at in the Norman Bezik article, as well as what um, Keith Curry Lance and Deborah Kochel were saying in that recent interview, um, is that school libraries that had made efforts to demonstrate the relevance of the library to what happens in the classroom yeah. were less vulnerable to budget cuts than those who hadn't or who yeah. were only appeared to be focused on reading for pleasure. Yeah. And the only way I think that we can genuinely demonstrate the value of the library to what happens in the classroom is through an inquiry-centered approach that encompasses all of the instructional activities. Yeah. So our so our opportunities finishing on a on a positive note is that if school librarians begin to understand and be able to vocalize and explain their purpose, then what's coming next in the change of government in the UK is possibly putting ourselves in the position to be able to make a change when it's when it appears for us. <laughs> is that about right? <laughs> so I think um, the view of what education is what it, what education is for what learning is and how learning happens what is necessary to support learning that will i think be more sympathetic more open to the value that the library can bring if we have worked through yeah the purpose and the mission of the library um yeah. and are are able to articulate that in a way that teachers can understand and value absolutely yeah fantastic okay well we've whizzed through those questions thank you so much for spending your time and giving your knowledge i always learn something daryl it's always good to talk to you we hope that anybody listening has enjoyed listening to our po fossil podcast. As always, if you'd like to comment on anything you've heard, we'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss out on future discussions. 
and we look forward to the next 12 months of very interesting conversations, things like artificial intelligence and new, new government changes and all the else that school libraries should be involved with. We look forward to speaking to you soon.